All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Romans chapter 12. We did finish the book of Mark last week. It was uh, as we walked through Jesus coming on earth and coming and meeting John the Baptist all the way to the cross. And uh, you had to see the centurion give his heart to the Lord and the disciples kind of left, you know, with that excitement of now we have the gospel. We're going to go out into the world. What are we going to do with it? And as I was thinking about this tonight, uh, before we jump into a whole other book, I thought it would be good to do a mini series on just the gifts of the Spirit. And um, so more uh, appropriately, all of the gifts, whether it be uh, the gifts, the manifestations, or actually the ministries that the Holy Spirit gives us as Christians to continue to, to fulfill the gospel message that he told the disciples to go out last week, and he told them the simple word is, go, go do it, go do what I've shown you, go do what I've lived the last three and a half years with you doing, and now fulfill, fulfill the ministry that you have on your life. And, you know, as a small church, you know, we are growing together, uh, we're getting to know each other a little more, we're getting to develop friendships, and, um, you know, I hear testimonies and, and stories of how, you know, congregational members come together, and we help each other out, that's part of growing together. Um, so we help each other grow physically. We also help each other grow spiritually. And so, you know, what I want to do tonight as we're getting uh, uh, to be more of a core is I want you guys to examine tonight what is actually your calling as a Christian. Raise your hand if you know what your calling is. Come on. I got one, two. All right. That's where we need to be at. This is a good place to start because, you know, it, we need to understand that it takes all of us, every single person. Now, I w do want you to raise your hand this time. Who is all of us? Raise your hand. That's us, right? It's all of us. So it does take all of us to actually grow the body of Christ, whether it be in maturity or in number, all these different things. It takes every single one of us. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, you get into the Christian realm and uh, Jesus taught against it all the time that there's, there's no hierarchy in the church. There's offices in the church, but not one person is better or more spiritual than the other because of an office or a gift. Christ is the only one who is to be preeminent. He is to be above all things. And I've shared it over and over and over again. Even as pastor, I'm not head of the church. There's only one name that's above the church, and that's Jesus. That's who rules and reigns, and we all submit to him. We all serve because he loved us. Now, Paul starts out in 2 Corinthians 5.18 before we jump into Romans 12, and he tells us, he says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, raise your hand again, who's us? That's all of us, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So I want you to tell me tonight, I want you to actually say, I have a ministry. I have a ministry. Okay, it's not just the pastor, it's not just the elders, it's not just the praise and worship leader or the children's director. God has a call on your life tonight, and all of us have been entrusted with that ministry. It's a gift to us, just like, you know, uh, at this time it's a perfect time to look at gifts because it was given to us by grace, just like the salvation that we talked about at the end of Mark. We learned that we didn't earn that. We were gifted salvation because of what Christ has done on the cross, and we have been gifted the gifts of ministry simply because He wanted us to have them to fulfill the ministry He called us and said, go out and do. So uh, as we get into Romans 12, I want to do a quick overview of why Paul is writing this letter. So um, to give a little bit a brief, uh, brief background, so that was hard to say three times fast. Acts chapter uh, 4, there was a great persecution in the church. So the church was just starting out. Remember, Jesus said, go, that they had the day of Pentecost. And uh, by day by day, the church was increasing. They had two big church services where over 10,000 people had come to know Jesus. So the church is just growing like a wildfire. Uh, but the problem was the Jewish extremists who were not Christians, but they were the Jewish faith, they kept trying to make trouble and stir up problems for the early church. And so what they did uh, is they go out and get protests and marches and get big uh, groups of people together to come against the Christian church. And so what happened was the Roman leaders saw this as this is a Jewish thing. And so all these Jews must be causing trouble for me. And, you know, if I'm going to keep my office in the Roman leadership, I can't have uprising. I can't have all these things going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a decree where no Jewish individuals can enter the city of Rome. They can't come in here anymore. And so they kick them all out. They scatter them all out from Rome. And what happened was the church was thriving in Rome. And because of the Jewish descent of individuals that were Christians, 
all the church leadership that were Jewish had to leave. And what you were left with was very baby, young, Gentile Christians who were left and said, here's the church, keep it going. I mean, you got some catching up to do. you got some studying to do. We, you know, we're, we're scholars in the law. We know the Old Testament. And so the church was handed to a very young group of Gentile believers. But after that Roman Empire or emperor died, um, they were allowed to come back into Rome. And what happened was, uh, when they all came in, the church was used to grow mightily while they're outward because, you know, they scattered them everywhere. That's the worst thing you do with Christians is scatter them all over the world because then you have little churches that pop up everywhere, just like we're having here. And so that didn't stop them. But what happened was the ones that had started the church originally came back to Rome and said, hey, we, we're, we're here. We're here again. We're, we're the kind of the, the saviors of the church. We started it. We know what we're doing. But the problem was over the last couple decades, the Christians that were Gentiles had grown up in the Lord. They had become solid leaders. They had a good place in the church. And so imagine this. You have Je Jewish leaders coming in and Gentile leaders of the church. And what do you think happened? They butted heads. And so there was division among the church saying, hey, well, I, I should be in leadership because I'm a Jew and you're a Gentile. And so Paul has to come in and kind of combat this problem that, hey, wait a minute. The church is supposed to be united. Haven't you read the book of Philippians yet? That's what he's kind of telling them. Have you, have you not seen what the body of Christ was supposed to be like? It was supposed to represent Jesus and when sinners not be up front arguing about who is to be uh, in leadership. So he helps them to understand by writing this that God still has a plan for the Jews, yes. But the Gentiles were grafted in to be part of the plan of redemption. So both Jew and Gentile, knowing now that they're part of this redemption plan, he gets into verse or chapter 12, and he wants them to know and understand that one is not better than the other because of your descent or because of your office or because who you are. So Paul explains that the church should be united, and the way to do this is through the gifts that God has given us by grace. What does grace mean? unmerited favor. If you really want to boil it down, it means I could not have earned it if I wanted to or had the ability to, to do it. So it was given to us by grace. And he says, these gifts that the Spirit has given us will do the job of, you, of uniting the church together. So you, you might be saying, wait a minute, you know, the spiritual gifts are in Romans chapter 12, aren't they? And one book over, you know, get the right, the right chapter, Pastor Dwayne, of chapter 12, but aren't they in 1 Corinthians? And so I want to address that before we jump in. So um, the word gifts, actually, in 1 Corinthians 12, um, most of your Bibles, if you have New King James or King James, it will be italicized in that word, uh, gifts. And what it's actually trying to point out is it, that word gifts was not actually in the original Greek translation of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul uses actually the Greek word, I'm going to slaughter this the best I can, pneumatikitos, uh, which means spirituals. And so this word that he's translated, we translated as Greek as gifts, actually means spirituals. And that word actually means the entire manifestation of the spirit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is talking about the manifestation of the Holy Spirit inside of ministries, or to put it in Dwayne's terms, it's how the Holy Spirit reveals himself practically so that we know that he's in the ministry. So that's what it's talking about here. So the Holy Spirit reveals himself here, but in Romans chapter 12, uh, it's talking about the gifts, and it's actually the only place in Scripture where the spiritual gifts are spoken of directly are these ones right here in verse, or chapter 12. And most theologians will speak of these certain gifts as the motiv uh, motivational gifts, the ones that help us to motivate us to actually go out and do ministry or motivate the gospel to be you know, stirred in people's hearts. So beginning at verse 3, let's read the, verse, the first uh, six verses together. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another." So he's talking about individual members is how he finishes this sentence. Talking about those individuals, he goes on to verse 6 and says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. So there's that word gifts that's 
only spoken of in the original Greek right here in, in chapter 12 of Romans. And so he's describing that God has these gifts that he has given for ministry, and he's given them all to each, every one of them, to every believer. But the difference being some people will uh, operate in certain of these gifts more often than others. They just come more naturally. So there's different levels of grace where he says this could be more of your spiritual calling, but yet you will operate in all of these gifts at some point or another. In Paul's time, spiritual people were trying to prove how super spiritual they were in the church, that they had these spiritual gifts, and unfortunately it still goes on today. You will have people say, look, I'm better than this individual, or you know, I should have more office because I can do these things. But Paul combats that prideful thinking um, that somehow I'm better than the other by describing these gifts as being given by grace alone. It's not about who you are. It's about what God has wielded in our lives that he says, these are gifts I told you to go. So to give you confidence in going and explaining the gospel, to give you confidence in going to church and loving and serving others, I will give you the gifts to even be able to do what I've asked you to do. How much easier can it be to follow the Lord if he's given us these things? They are given to us to grow the body whether it be through numbers or through spiritual maturity. But the problem is, as we get away from this, the main focus of the gifts is to always point to Jesus. And as we go through the gifts tonight, you'll see, man, everything that we read about Jesus in the book of Mark, he is a perfect example of all these gifts. That's why they're referred to as the motivational gifts. It's to get us going. Paul's reminding them, do you remember when Jesus, when he was ascending and he was telling you to go, I've equipped you, and to not fear about anything? That's why. Remember where these gifts came from. They are tools that on their own, if you single all these ones out and you picked one specific gift, none of them can build the house of God on their own. It takes all the tools placed in the master carpenter's hand, which is Jesus, to build the church for God. We can't look at other tools or followers of Jesus as more or less than the other. And I remember, you know, when I was in high school, I used to work construction during the summer to earn money. And so, um, you know, that would be my spending money, and I would go out and do things that I would need to do. But, you know, it was also a good practice. My mom and dad didn't allow me, my mom's here tonight, to be lazy and just go out and have just a, you know, just do nothing all summer. They taught us a work ethic to, to build value. And so, uh, you know, my boss, though, he was a church member then, and he still follows me on Facebook now, so I'm not going to mention names because um, he might hear this tonight, but he was a hilarious boss to work for. And what I mean by that is he was so accident prone to do some of the most outlandish and out OSHA would have shut him down if OSHA was popular in the 90s. Um, they just would have done it. I remember once he didn't shut off the power to the electricity uh, to the house and he went up to the rooftop and in Kentucky there are balls that the all the electricity comes into and that's what joints it to come into your house and I remember he decided I'm not I don't need to call the power company and tell them to turn off the power I'm gonna do the service myself and I remember being inside doing the drywall hanging in the garage and I heard a sh and him scream and roll off the edge of the house into the mud pit that was on the side of the house. He shocked himself off the roof. Um, there was another time, uh, I remember that we were inside working again and we were re-roofing another house, but we were also doing the, the banister because the, the rain had come in and rotted the roof, it had rotted the, the stairwell. So we were taking the stairwell out, redoing the stairs, and I remember he was walking up top, he's like, I'm gonna do the inspection and kind of see what's wrong with the roof. And I say we were in there about an hour, and all of a sudden you just hear this cracking and crumbling, and all of a sudden I just I hear him scream as he steps through the rotting part of the roof and falls through it into the house, lands on the banister, and slides all the way down to the bottom. Um, just different things like this. He was very cheap, so he was very excited one day that uh, he bought his new truck for the company. And so he pulled it beside the house to protect it and so that we wouldn't hurt it or scratch it when we're pulling hoses or any of the tools going around. And I remember he had a wheelbarrow that he was doing shingles and he decided I'm going to go to the end of the house and dump off the shingles real quick. Well, he forgot where he parked his truck. So when he went and dumped the shingles off, where do you think the shingles went? through the roof of the brand new truck. So his truck was red, but it had a black roof because he had to go to the, the dump to get, or the, the graveyard of trucks to buy one for it. Um, so 
I'm not lying to you when I say this gentleman was only alive and is still alive today only by the grace of God. I mean, it was just time. That was only a handful of the things that he did. But I remember one day talking about tools when he purchased a nail gun. And so all summer we had been roofing the roofs with just hammer and nail. I mean, our knuckles were bloody and scratched up, and it would take hours to do it by just hammer and nail. And he was so excited because he bought this new nail gun, and he was saying, look, it's going to cut our time down in half. I'm going to save so much money because I don't have to pay you hourly, um, uh, but we're also going to get more jobs done. So he was really excited about that. But in turn, he bought a really cheap air compressor at a pawn shop. And so I remember he hooked it up. We got about an hour into the job. I remember when he first fired up the air compressor, it was loud, it was rattling. I'm like, that doesn't really sound right. And at about an hour in, that thing quit on him. So even though he had the most expensive nail gun you could get to roof a house, because he purchased the cheap air compressor, we couldn't get the job done. So when you're thinking about tools, when you're thinking about gifts of the Spirit, we have to have all of them working together, even though they're different. Even though they don't sound the same, look the same, we have to have all of them together to operate in the master carpenter's hands to work on building the God's kingdom in his house tonight. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're the tool slamming that nail into the wood or if you're the nail itself or that noisy old compressor. Each tool is different and special and has a place and God gives honor to those and he's talking about this through the Spirit speaking through Paul in Romans chapter 12, saying, I want to bring light to all of these things that make the church the church. So as we go through the gifts tonight, um, you know, on the back of your bulletins or a note, I want, you to, uh, I want you to understand the need that you have tonight to understand what is my spiritual gift. What am I supposed to be doing? What is my calling tonight? And that's something that we should be always asking ourselves. So let's pick it back up in verse 6 again. It says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Say these four words together. Let us use them. You didn't help out that much. Say it again. Let us use them. What's the key to this scripture? It's that ending verse. We have spiritual gifts that we should be using. We should be practicing our gifts. Are we, are we always going to get it right? Who saw the clicker tonight going out of control? It just zip 10 slides down the way, had to bring it back. Things mess up. We hit the wrong note. I miss what page I'm on in my notes. You know, the children's ministry, uh, we run out of crackers. Things don't always work perfectly. But time and time again, what's most important? That we're doing them, we're exercising. We're, we're in a place where we can grow together. We allow mistakes. You know, we can allow the hammer hitting the thumb for the millionth time. Uh, that's, how it's, that's how we grow together. We learn to grow in strengths and in weaknesses. So Paul, he breaks down here these gifts in the two categories. The first category, he talks about gifts that expound, and that word expound is to present or explain the Word of God. So the first gifts, he talks about how they expound the Word of God. That's the offices for it. And the second group of gifts that he's going to describe tonight are the ones that actually expand the work of the kingdom. They help it to go. They're, they're, they're behind it. They're the force. They're, the, they're you know, the foot soldiers on the ground, if you would. So let's start with the first group, expounding the Word of God. In verse 6, it goes on to say, talking about the gifts, if prophecy in proportion to our faith. So he's talking about the gift of prophecy. And this scares people sometimes. I, there are quacks out there. You know, it's so easy to always say, thus saith the Lord. Man, if that rolls off your lips very easily, you're probably not doing it right. So, you know, anytime you read about the Old Testament prophets or even the New Testament when they would prophesy, there was great fear and trembling. The Lord moved them to do a situation. It wasn't just something that came off their tongue easily. And so the definition here for prophecy is twofold. It's foretelling and forthtelling. So foretelling, he's describing, you know, if, if you're going to speak into someone's life or, you know, explain to them um, through prophecy what's going to happen down the road, he says it needs to be done in the boundaries of our faith. It needs to be done in there. So what does that mean? Well, part of that meaning is that we operate inside of faith. Is God going to tell us to prophesy something to someone that does not add up to Scripture? 
That's not going to happen. They have to coincide. They go together. They go hand in hand. And then also the other part of that, when he says it needs to be inside of our faith, it needs to stretch our faith. It shouldn't be easy for that to roll off our tongue. It should be, hey, wait a minute, I've got to actually step out my comfort zone and do something that's not comfortable to me and tell somebody something. It could be good, it could be hard, whatever it might be, but it has to be inside of the boundaries of our faith and it has to stretch us because prophecy is to be used in the utmost seriousness. And there's too much foolishness going on. It went on in Paul's day and it goes on today. But more appropriately is the second definition of prophecy, forthtelling. So what is forthtelling? That, that's the part of prophecy that when Paul talks about it in Corinthians later, he says, hey, you know, one of the greatest gifts is prophecy. Seek this one. And this is what he's talking about here in Scripture. Is it sh It's sharing the heart and mind of God, not necessarily predicting anything, but rather it's declaring the truth of God's word with a passionate heart that burns and it has to drive. I got I have something in the scripture I gotta share with you. It drives us, it pushes us to go share that with someone. And that's what prophecy is talking about. It's speaking God's word and heart into someone's life or a situation that provides truth in their life so that the Holy Spirit can then have a foundation to work upon changing them. But as Paul tells us about the gospel. How are they going to believe unless somebody preaches to them? Unless somebody tells them about the truth? And that's what prophecy is for. It's stepping outside of our comfort zone to tell people the truth about what God tells us in the Word. Verse 7, it goes on to say the second gift. If service in our serving. So that second gift is of service. Some translations will say ministry. And so prophecy, think about it like this. Prophecy speaks or declares the truth. And then service depicts the truth. Now think about the book of Mark. What happened to Jesus' stories in the first part of that when he was talking about when he first started preaching and teaching? What did he always do? He would open up with preaching and teaching and all of a sudden he would go out and touch individuals' lives. He wouldn't just teach. He went out and did. So service is actually practically reaching out and ministering to people's lives. And Paul sees this specific ministry as vital. It's number two in his list that this is so important that the Holy Spirit operates in this way to even give us the ability to serve. You know, there's a great Christian woman um, she had a funny name. Her name was Dorcas in Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 9. She died. It doesn't tell us much about her, but it does tell us that the church almost flipped upside down with great mourning and sorrow over this little lady that we don't know much about. All we know is that uh, what her vital ministry was to the church, that that her ministry that depicted the heart of Christ to individuals in such a way that they said this was a pillar of our church. She was a true leader. She did two things. She sewed people's clothes back up and she gave them a warm place to sleep. And it flipped the church upside down. Like Jesus, she touched people's lives by living out the servant heart of Jesus in a simple but profound way. You know, you might say, what talents do I have? What gifts do I have? How many of you can sew? I know there's a couple of you. There we go. We've got some. How many of you can offer a person a warm coat? How many can offer a person a warm meal? Now, it doesn't sound like much, but with the Holy Spirit behind it, with the Holy Spirit power coming behind that to change the life, that's all he needed. He needed it in saying, you know, I don't have much, but what I got, I'll give to you. I'll let me share with what, you, with what I have. And let me tell you why I want to share with what little I have with you. It's about Jesus. And it turned people's lives upside down. It goes on to verse 7, the third gift. And the one who teaches in his teaching. So the gift of teaching is different than prophecy. Prophecy sporadically uh, tells about the truth. It, you know, it just, it, it waits until there's just this moment that the, the truth needs to be said and it may not feel comfortable. It may not feel, um, you, know, you know, easy to go do. But teaching is one who instructs. So instead of being sporadic, it systematically teaches others about the truth. And this is not just a pastor. 
We've got to get that thinking out of our mind. This is not just for the pastor, but what Paul has told us is this gift is for all believers. Teachers take the time to define what something means and help others to grow. This could be a parent. This could be a boss. This could be a teacher. Or this could be just you sitting with your friend over a cup of coffee and expounding in their lives. It could be that simple. It's a teaching moment. Jesus would instruct around the dinner table every single night. He didn't need a pulpit. He was there to share with those who would listen. And he would often start with, Have you heard the scriptures say this? And then he would say, Have you ever thought about this? Just easy conversations about the Word of God. And, he, and we know what Jesus' ministry was like. He, he just changed the world with simple teaching. And he did it with focusing on 12 guys. 12 individuals. And one of them fell away. That's how simple it can be. We're to teach to family, to friends, to strangers. Verse 8 goes on to say, talks about the one who exhorts in his exhortation. So, you know, Christians are called sheep for a reason. Jesus calls us that. It's not a great name. I know we all think about the sheep are cute and cuddly, but really, sheep are dumb. They're, they're not great animals. If you leave them in an area, they will eat the grass to the point it dies and it will not come back. Like they will kill themselves because of they're driven by their appetites. So this gift of exhortation, if you did not have exhorters in the body, if you did not have people who would come in and do this, what you would end up with with just teaching is you would have a bunch of fat sheep. They would just continuously do what? Feed. They would never get off the seat. They would never do anything. So think about it this way. Prophecy declares the truth. Service depicts the truth, and exhortation drives the truth. And so, you know, you know these individuals, they're annoying people. I'm going to be flat out honest. Why? Because they kick us in the pants. They tell us things, hey, you should be doing this. You, you have the ability, you have the strength. Why aren't you doing it? They motivate us. Often the body doesn't like exhorters because they call us out. Like, wait a minute, what, who are you to call me out? Well, Scripture says they have a place. And oftentimes we need to be listening. Is this God calling me out? Now, there's going to be some that are not doing it in the right spirit. And they're not doing it for the right reasons. But oftentimes, if someone's coming to you in love, saying, I see you doing more than what you're doing now. God has created you for something that is so grand and glorious in His redemptive plan to save other souls. You have this gift. Why are you wasting it? When people come to you like that, it's a much different feeling. But I'm telling you, we have to have exhorters in the body. Even as small as we are right now, we need people who exhort each other to move forward. We need to push ourselves. We need to have others push us to exercise our faith, to exercise these gifts that God has given us. Prophecy, serving, teaching, exhorting. Those four things are all gifts that expound or explain the Word of God. And Paul stops right there for a second, and then he turns the page on the second group of gifts about expanding the work of the gospel. So look at verse 8 together. So the one who con contributes in generosity, it could be giving or it could be, uh, you know, whatever translation, it could go into something else, but basically it's talking about the gift of giving. So through this spiritual gift that we have, and this is more than just giving to the church. This is being generous with what we have to promote God's kingdom. So God supplies the resources that He needs to expand the work through us. We're, we're kind of like these channels that supplies the needs for what God's doing in an area. We're to give generously, it describes. This means that with no strings. This doesn't mean just, hey, I'm going to give you everything foolishly. It means when we give a gift, when we uh, let it go out of our hands, we don't have any strings attached. We don't say, well, if you do this with it, then I'll give it to you. We are to give freely and openly, and that allows us to do the next great thing is to trust God with it. God, you told me to do this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to give to this person, or I'm going to help this person, or I'm going to give to the church, or whatever it might be. We trust Him with the finances. Now, we have to do a little bit of warning here. He tells us to do it generously because when we stop giving generously, when we stop giving in such a way that we trust God with what we're doing, and we say, it has to be like this or that or, you know, pay me back, all these different things, what happens is 
we find the blessings that we're always in and blessed with to have more abundance of to start to shrivel up. And what do I mean by that? You know, He always supplies our needs. That's, that's the promise. He'll always take care of us. But God gives us above and beyond our needs to do what? To bless others. Not to store up treasures on earth. We learned about that in the parable. The, the foolish guy who said, hey, you know what? I've got so much food that my storehouses won't even hold it anymore. And instead of blessing others, he says, I'm going to tear down my old barns and I'm going to build new ones so I can store it more. And what happened? That night... His soul was required of him. and said, foolish guy, why were you doing this when I gave this to you to be a blessing to others? So God is serious about that. If we have abundance, it's not to store up. It's to give. It's to give freely and trust Him with it. And I'm not promoting not to be wise or good stewards. That's not what I'm talking about. The Bible is very clear. We are to be good stewards with our money. We are to be wise. We are to you know, take care of ourselves. But what does that really look like? Do, do I really need this? Do I really need that? And so we need to examine that every day. So he says, be a giver, but do it, generos- or do it with generosity in our hearts, not re- uh, you know, with strings attached. Verse 8, again, it goes on to say, the one who leads with zeal. So I'm a leader because I'm a pastor, okay? That's one of my callings. And so it is really hard as a leader to come in day in and day out. I'm just going to be truthful and honest with you and serve the Lord as a leader without losing heart some days. It is difficult. You have to pull yourself up and you have to cry out to God and say, God, I don't have the energy to do it today. I don't have the drive to do it. And be honest with Him. But leaders are people who help hold things together in the body of Christ or out in the community. It doesn't have to be just in the church. It could be, you know, I've had neighbors in the past who said, you know, I've got this one neighbor who just, he just kind of holds the cul-de-sac together sometimes. And when people are in need, he's there. Or he, you know, he, he gets all the other neighbors to go over and fix the, 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 the Christmas lights for the older couple. He's just a leader in his, in his neighborhood. It's individuals who will jump into the trenches and be the first one to do it. That's leaders. They have people to follow them. And Paul says they are to lead with zeal. And that's what I'm talking about. It's easy for leaders to grow weary and tired. And there's usually two reasons for that. One, we could be leading in something that we should not be leading in. We could be doing something that we're not called or gifted to do. The other reason is, we could have the wrong heart in what we're doing. And so Paul is telling us, I want you to persevere in the Lord and follow him with zeal. Nehemiah was one of those leaders who was working on the wall. And he was, you know, on one hand, he had enemies who were threatening to kill him. He had, um, you know, the wall work that had to be done. They had to have it done in such amount of time. And he had the, the kind of the pressure from the king to have to go back and do the job he was already doing. But this is what he says when everything was going in his full bore. He said, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So here's someone who's worked to the bone. He's tired. He has nothing left physically. How does he keep going? How do we keep going and not get burned out? It's the joy that God has for the work. He says, My Burden is light. My, my, my yoke is easy. He tells us that. doesn't mean the work's really easy, but there's just this supernatural strength that comes that no matter what we go through, whether tonight, whether you know the kids are all acting up at my house, whether we're arguing before we get out the door. You know, Sherry's talking about sometimes we don't feel like we deserve to be up here, and that's right, we don't. It's only by grace do we have these gifts. It's only by grace that it was gifted to us. And it's a good time to be knocked down every once in a while and be humble and say, you know what, I forgot. It's grace that I'm being able to do these things. It's a great reminder. So we're to do it with the joy of the Lord so He can create that zeal in us to continue on. Uh, Verse 8 goes on to say, And the one who does acts of mercy with 
cheerfulness. So these are those individuals who sympathize with people who go through trauma. They cry when somebody is mourning or they walk through somebody when a family is splitting up. They just, they're just there. They, they have this gift of mercy. And Jesus displayed these gifts, all these things, whether he ministered in mercy or he led with zeal or he taught in prophecy or he gave sacrificially. He was that perfect example of how these gifts are to function in the church. And that's a grand ministry that we learn in the book of Mark. The gifts are ministered by the Holy Spirit to minister like Jesus because they ultimately point to him, saying what is different about the church than every other organization in the world? It looks like Christ. Nothing else does. They can mimic for a little bit. They might have some things that they try to do. But when it comes to unity, when it comes to loving others, when it comes to really walking through life together, that's always and will be the church We shared that one time, even in the federal government, everything that the American government gives to help individuals, the church always outgives them by way more, and they will never put that on the news. Why? Because they don't want the glory to go to God. That's God's people following the call, go and serve. And then verse 9 just wraps it up here in the first part of the verse. It says, let love be genuine. So this is a small section of what is, what is it really like to live like a Christian to others and with others. We find the will of God, if we look here, when we give our life to him, is what Paul is saying to the, to the Romans. Stop worrying about your position. You still have a call on your life, whether you're the pastor, the praise and worship leader, or you're just the person coming in to you know, hear the gospel and take it back out to the community. They're all vital. They're all important. And don't ever think otherwise. And when we allow those gifts to operate out of love for God and for one another in all genuineness, then we're in the will of God. That's a great place to be. That's, that's where the zeal comes from, the joy that keeps pushing us forward. So, you know, we just looked at these simply tonight, practically. And you might be asking... What is my primary spiritual gift? Has anybody ever wondered that? What am, what am I really called to do? You know, early on in my life, that's what I, I had a dad for a pastor. I had brothers who became pastors. Um, you know, I grew up in the church, and I never knew what my calling was until I gave my heart to him, and I started seeking him. And I want you to write this question down tonight. This is how I looked at it. So to answer that question of what is my spiritual gift is quite easy. You ask another question. I want you to write this down tonight. If you suddenly became pastor or a pastor at Gathering Stones Calvary Chapel, what would you change? It's a very simple question. What would you change? So would you find yourself grabbing the mic and calling your fellow body to action to share the gospel and to speak God's word to a hurting community, chances are your gift might be prophecy. Would you split us all up into small groups to minister to the needs of others and reach out to our community? If that's where your heart is, chances are your gift is service. Do you desire to lead a group and to study the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic and to dive deeper into theologies and to the doctrines of the Scripture? Chances are you might have the gift of teaching. Do you desire to fundraise for mission trips or outreaches or you know, to bring supplies to our children's ministry or um, you know, reach out in any way that you can uh, and say, you know what, I want to put the agape bags together, these little bags that uh, you know, we give out to the homeless from time to time where we put all the, the, the goodies inside, whether it be toothbrushes and toothpaste and things they need, the hygiene items. If that's you, chances are you might have the gift of generosity. Does your heart cry out just to go hug someone when they're hurting. And you, you know, you will, you'll turn off the TV whether the, the Seahawks are in the Super Bowl or you're, you know, you're in the, the last final stages of Chopped and you don't get to see who got Chopped. Whatever it might be, you say, I've got to get to this person. They need me. They're in the hospital. They're hurting or they're hurting at home alone. All these different things. If that's you, chances are your gift is mercy. Perhaps you see things that can make the church run smoother Or you'd want to encourage people to step out and to help. Your gift could be leading or exhorting. 
the answer to what you would change is often a good, to, a good clue as to what your calling is. The problem is, because of what we are as American society, God calls on many, many, many different people to answer that calling. And what they do is they get it confused because many people will see things in the church that they want to change or add to, and then they put that existing leadership to the test and say, you need to change this, you need to add it. And if that change doesn't happen, what do you think happens? They leave the church. They go church hopping. They find somewhere else that provides for that need. When in fact, God was revealing the need to them for a reason so that they could step up and fulfill that need and their own calling in that church. That's why God brings it to us and we get this kind of uh, this mentality. And I've done it many, many times where we get, hey, you know, leadership should be doing this. Or, you know, I don't like the way they do that. It's not God doesn't call us to be critics. God calls us to be called to the service that He's called us to. Church is not about coming to be served. That does happen from time to time. If, if you're in need, the body will come alongside of you. But that's not the primary reason that we show up. For us gathering together is to minister to each other. It's to look out for one another. And if you're someone, or, or if you know someone that is constantly church hopping because they're looking for more, do you think they're ever going to be filled? No, they're always going to continue to church hop. There's always going to be something that looks better, it's flashier, uh, you know, they have a mini mall inside, whatever it might be, but they're always going to be searching. They're never going to be filled because God is asking them to be poured out for His service. You know, I always want to, I was on that, that trip at, the, at a early, when I was 17 or 18, I always want to be filled, I want to be filled. And I realized I was never able to be filled until I allowed God to pour me out as a drink offering. And then it never stopped pouring. It was a continuously filling up. So they will not be filled looking for that. And we are called to use our gifting in the body. When God brings it to our attention, don't use it as an excuse to leave, but understand it's a call to step up. So my mom is here tonight. I've asked her to come up and play a song of Amazing Grace on the piano for us so you can kind of see where uh, my background is. But as we're doing this, um, if there's a gift that stood out to you tonight and said, you know what, that's my heart. I heard, I heard a description. I, I saw myself doing exactly what that gift was in some fashion or form. It could be the smallest thing to you or the biggest thing. It, it doesn't really matter, but God has a calling for you in that area. And so as we as we close in a song of worship tonight, I want each of us afterwards to pray for one another. I want you to walk up and say, hey, was there a gift that stood out to you? And you may come out and say, you know what, a gift didn't stand out to me yet. And that's okay too. But if there's a gift that stood out to you, I want you to pray for that individual, for that gift. If, there, if you don't know and didn't stand out to you, I still want you to pray for that individual. God, make it known to them. Give them a desire to do what you've called them and made them and created them to do. And that you paid the price on Calvary for them to have the gifts to go out and do this. Would you stand with me? And we'll pray tonight and we'll end in the song of Amazing Grace. Because that's really what it's all about. We have an amazing grace that has saved us and gifted us to have breath in our bodies to continue the ministry. God, we just thank you tonight for the call in our lives. We thank you that you have made it clear to us that you are with us. And God, I, I thank